we'll move on to Barry Culligan. He is a reader, has been a reader for 20 years. He's the current president of Great Britain and Ireland Urantia Association, and his presentation is on Becoming Godlike. Take it away, Barry. Okay, I'm going to start my uh, screen share now. Um, let me know how that works out. Becoming Godlike. This is a topic I'm uh, very interested in. It uh, forms part of the one of the fundamental spiritual cores of the Urantia book. The process itself in Christian theology is called theosis. And uh, we see there's different expressions, the indivinization, becoming godlike. Um, and it's, there's a long philosophical tradition about it. It's uh, much more prevalent in the Eastern Orthodox tradition than it is in the Western tradition, although it is, it is present there too. There's a uh, kind of certain philosophical objections, but I'm gonna take it from uh, just a, a Urantian perspective, and I'm going to include uh, one source author's comments just to help move things along. So, uh, let me see. Right. God knowing creatures have only one supreme ambition, just one consuming desire, and that is to become as they are in their spheres, like Him as He is in His paradise uh, sphere of perfection of personality and in His universe sphere of righteous supremacy. I can't actually see the the thing here in the way. Um, from the universe of our Father who inhabits eternity, there has gone forth a supreme mandate, be you perfect even as I am perfect. Now, I have been fascinated by uh, this whole be you perfect as I am perfect. This is invitation to become like God. And it's also interesting and I think significant that it's the third paragraph of the Orantia book and they introduce this. This is for them, the, the opening and closing statements, it's important for us to keep focused on the, what perfection is. The old concepts of the, the gods, they were all power. You know, Zeus and his uh, thunderbolts, the gods had unlimited power and none of the responsibility. But the God that, that we follow, the God that we believe, isn't like that God. He's a creator God. Like when we see the, the old images of, of God, there were gods made in our image. It was all power and he could, or it could do anything it wanted. It was a God of vengeance and a God of cruelty. And in essence, it was the God that uh, reflected who we were, you know. Um, evolution tends to make uh, God men, like revelation tends to make man godlike. And I thought that was one of the coolest things in the Urantia book, that it, it says to us that, the old religions uh, kind of created gods in their own image, whereas the religions of Revelation seeks to that God trying to create man in His image, trying to make him better than than he uh, than he was. So when I was thinking of God during the week and thinking about this lecture, I was thinking about how God had unlimited power, unlimited possibility, and the thing that He decides to do is create a universe where joy can be multiplied where wonderful things can happen, where horizons are endlessly expanding, where joy is endlessly increasing and revelation is endlessly broadening. He created a universe that could be shared that was absolutely fantastic. Instead of just doing something selfish, he did something selfless and created a space to be shared, to have shared joy, shared hope, shared adventures. You know? And that is uh, quite inspiring. And when we, we look at, at God as our model and becoming like God, we need to look at, say, all the power and ability and opportunity we have in our, our lives and how we can use that power and ability to enhance the lives of others. And in doing that, we do become like God in our ideals, in our aspirations, in our hopes and in our efforts. Um, so we see this comment here, spiritual greatness consists in an understanding love that is godlike and not in an enjoyment of the exercise of material power for the exaltation of self. So God's very nature is uh, a, it's a selfless uh, love. And the, the images of, of kind of the gods in the past were kind of derived from our ego and they were all about power, whereas God is all about service. And that's what we see in, uh, in something like the parable of the sower. In the parable of the sower, we see Jesus takes on the attitude of the, of the servant. He comes to serve, and that's what God's whole thing is. He's creating something to serve, to, to help us become uh, better beings, and uh, to 
allure us into uh, the pursuit of perfection. Okay, so this particular guy here. So what I want to talk about is to what sorts of things interrupt us, or our challenges do we face in this pursuit of perfection, in this pursuit of uh, God-likeness, of our Godhood, okay? We have one thing, our material bodies. Our material bodies, so, and we are born in a particular time and place. So we are conditioned by our material form, and we are conditioned by our culture. This particular fellow that you see here, his name is uh, Ivan Pavlov, and he did an experiment with some dogs and became known as Pavlov's dogs. So he set up a situation where uh, he saw dogs used to salivate when they were getting their dinner. And he so put a bell uh, with that particular stimulus. And eventually the dogs learned to associate the bell with the food. So that when, they rang, when he rang the bell, they began to salivate uh, before the food was even presented. Okay, so our experiences in life condition us to act and live and behave in a certain way. And that sort of conditioning, it kind of becomes a framework or a structure to help us uh, to grow, but it can also become a prism. So here's a story, the story of the 10 monkeys. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I'll go through it for you for now, okay? Once upon a time, scientists put 10 monkeys in a cage. In the center of the cage, there was a step ladder. On top of the step ladder, there was a bunch of bananas. Now, as the monkeys spotted the bananas, they began to walk towards the, the step ladder. And as soon as the monkey stepped on the step ladder, uh, freezing hoses uh, blasted, or hoses blasted freezing water down on all the other monkeys, so that they began to realize that if you go near that, you're going to get blasted. So a couple of more monkeys tried it, they all got blasted, they realized, no, we can't go near that step ladder. So the scientists decided to change things then. They decided they would, uh, take out one monkey and put in an entirely new one. And the entirely new guy who spots the bananas goes, oh, lovely. And off he goes to get his uh, to get his bananas. But as soon as he puts a foot on the step ladder, the rest of the monkeys descend upon him and beat the life out of him and say, don't go near that ladder. And uh, the scientists repeat this process. They replace one monkey after another. And uh, eventually all the monkeys are replaced, but none of the monkeys have ever been blasted by the water. And they all have now uh, been conditioned to leave the step ladder alone. Their culture now has got them in a, in a frame of mind where they are not going to go near that banana because, and they don't know why. They don't know why. So this is an important lesson. When you live within a culture, when you're raised within a, a, a particular milieu, you have to question uh, why we do things the way we do, you know, is, is it always acceptable, you know, and some people never really uh, examine life, they just accept things as, as, it, as it is, you know, and they will defend the, the culture instead of uh, allowing it to be questioned and to be evolved. So here's an example. This is Catherine Schweitzer. She uh, went to run the 1967 Boston Marathon. And you can see all the monkeys are chasing after her there to make sure that she doesn't go up on top of the uh, step ladder. Okay, so this is an example of cultural conditioning, even though these particular individuals are, I'm sure, enlightened, they're well able to read, do their sums, hold down a job, uh, they're still bound by their culture. They cannot accept that things could be done differently, that, that, that women uh, might uh, live in a equal to men or be entitled to, to engage in a, in a race the same as men. Uh, a little earlier, 1957, we have here Elizabeth Eckford from uh, Little Rock High in 1957. Now, I'd like you to take a look at the people in the background, those fine Christian women there, and you can see the anger in their faces. You know, I'm sure that in their own communities, they were uh, lovely, lovely women and good to their family, good neighbors. But um, when it comes to uh, touching the bananas on top of the, the stepladder, they're not for it. So the Arantia book talks about this. It talks about, it says, it is indeed pitiful to behold giant intellects held so securely within the cruel grasp of cultural bondage. You know, and it tries to, um, it, it, it shows that even though we are, we're, we're so intelligent in so many ways, can we get rid of that thing? Sorry. Um, so intelligent in so many ways, we can still be caught, we can still, have our minds imprisoned by uh, our cultural experiences and by our physical experiences. 
and we can't really uh, do anything about that so long as we're not conscious of it. So here we have a picture of Homer. So on the good side, we've got the angel, which is the urge of the angels, the indwelling spirit, um, the, the, the spirit of truth, all those things which are encouraging us into the pursuit of perfection and in the acquisition of the dignity of the child of God. And on the other side, then we've got our material nature with its weaknesses and its strengths, its uh, conditioning and stuff like that. And there's always a, a wrestling match going on there. Now, we can't fix things that we're not aware of. Like, for example, I don't know if you've ever met anybody who talks really loudly. Uh, <laughs> they can really bellow, and they, they're not conscious of the fact that when they're speaking, they're just they're <laughs> so loud, or maybe they have a terrible BO problem, and they're not aware of it because they can't smell themselves. You know, And it's not until somebody says, you know, John, you need to keep it down a bit, or, or Jack, you need to, to have a shower, that they can actually do something about it. And when it comes to... Uh, improving ourselves we can only improve the things of which we are aware so i like this image it's, it's very interesting uh, man cannot remake himself without suffering for he is both the marble and the sculptor so we are the the thing that we have to work with we are the raw material you know and the this uh being being refashioned being perfected is uh difficult because it it, it necessitates the cutting away of the unhelpful the harmful, toxic patterns of behavior that we've lived uh, with before, you know. It's another example, similar. So we begin in our imperfection and we pursue uh, the perfection of our character so that we can emulate in our lives uh, the life of God. Um, and it takes effort, it takes struggle, you know, it's not, it's not easy, but it's always worth it. One of the questions that you need to ask when it comes to the pursuit of perfection is, would a more perfect me be happier than I am? Would a more perfect me have more love in his life, more hope, more peace, uh, more joy, more friends, uh, better health? You know, the pursuit of perfection means the pursuit of a richer life, richer in joy, richer in peace, richer in love, richer in wonder, richer in revelation. That's what, when God invites you to perfection, he's inviting you to the attainment of something magnificent, uh, the, 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 the magnificence that, that you could be. Okay, that's what you're invited to, and why not? So we have our material force, but we have a conspiracy of spiritual agencies helping us to become everything we could possibly be. So here's uh, Rick Warren's old meme. I had it on my page there recently, I picked it up. Um, Even on your antia, these seraphim teach the everlasting truth. If your own mind does not serve you well, you can exchange it for the mind of Jesus of Nazareth, who always serves you well. I love this idea that we can become uh, like Jesus, you know, and I'll be talking more about that uh, in, in, in due course. So I like this line from Walt Whitman. Re-examine all you've been told at school or church or in any book and dismiss whatever insults your own soul. Um, I think that's, that's uh, so important uh, for me, you know, to, to have, the, cult, to have the, the strength of character turn around and, and reject the... The way the herd is going you know uh, that takes an awful lot of character it takes it takes strength to turn around and say no i, I need to find my own way to follow the beat of a different drum uh, it, it it requires a, a kind of a pioneering spirit and an indomitable spirit you know uh, to and to dismiss whatever insults your soul i know in my own experience one of the biggest challenges i had is after i found jesus was um uh, he, he was kind of locked in tradition you know, I found Jesus uh, through uh, evangelical Christians, through the evangelical work of, of uh, Christians who were Bible believing. And the problem I had is that uh, their tradition was full of hell and doom and death and darkness. And I was just like, I can't, I can't, I can't buy that. It can't be true. I believe Jesus, but I don't believe that the, the, all the traditions about him were true. And so I had to uh, go my own way and uh, search for uh, Jesus and I, I literally handed it over to Jesus and said, you can you can help me find an answer to my problems and uh, because I, I I can't accept that the theologies that they're offering me are true you know and uh, within a few weeks I found the Arantia book you know and that's as you can see 20 years later here I am now so the key is know thyself like the the practice of theosis from within the Greek tradition uh, 
it's all about understanding yourself and that you see that in in the scriptures too that the the, the the prophets are always saying, set a watch in your tongue, you know, be be watchful, always be alert to, to sin entering into the soul, into the temple, you know, that, that you might uh, entertain uh, an unsavory thought. Okay, so this, this picture I use to, to make a, a point. So we have a material body, we have a mind. Now, a seed, a seed for a flower has uh, two key drives. It has a geotropic drive, which drives roots down into the ground, and it has a heliotropic drive, or a phototropic drive, which causes the flowers to go up to the sun. And in this way, it's nourished and it grows. You can see these flowers are turned towards the sun. Now, we being spiritual beings, we also have what I call a theotropic drive, uh, an urge for God you know, and that that soul turns to God all the time, and it's always looking for the sustenance of spiritual light, the, of spiritual ideals, of truth, beauty, and goodness. We need those things for our soul. We need hope, like, and uh, like we need food for our body. We need uh, information for our mind, but we need uh, spiritually sustaining realities for our soul. And in the absence of those things, uh, we can die. Like you'll die so long without uh, bread. You'll you'll only live so long without an education. But uh, in the absence of hope, in the absence of love, uh, in the absence of faith, your your existence is uh, the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. They're, they're they're really important, even though they're not something that you can eat with your uh, with a fork. You know, they're still real. They're still significant, and they have to be held on to. So we have to nurture our spirit, self, our soul. This is important, okay? Because it's an aspect of us, and it is a working aspect of us. Okay, now I wonder can I move these uh, images here because it's a bit distracting. Great, um, man is this this guy is James Allen. He's a source author for the Urantia book, and he's got some fantastic stuff. And you can get his books from Amazon for like eleven quid, and it's like seventeen books. It's great, great stuff. So man is unmade. Uh, man is made or unmade by himself. In the armory of thought, he forges the weapons by which he destroys himself. He also fashions the tools with which he builds for himself heavenly mansions of joy and strength and peace. By the right choice and true application of thought, a man ascends to the divine perfection. By the abuse and wrong application of thought, he descends below the level of the beast. Between these two extremes are all the grades of character, and man is their maker and master. So we have the power within us, and even the Urantia book speaks specifically about mind being the key arena through which we affect all these transformations of character. Now, one of the things I would like to, to focus on, this is one of Gary's um, uh, memes, that are, he makes such beautiful work. Uh, props to Gar. Uh, True liberty is the fruit of self-control. Now, the Urantia book talks about all those spirit poisons of hate and anger and prejudice and jealousy. And, one of the things that it talks about is anger is a symptom of losing control. You know yourself when you want things to go a certain way and you start getting angrier and angrier until eventually what actually happens is you're, you're losing control. And if you've ever lost control and temper, you'll know like you you always emerge from the other side of it uh, with a little less dignity. That's the nature of, of, the, of anger, you know. So liberty is the true liberty is the fruit of self-control. There was a, an old French author by the name of August Sabatier, and he once said that uh, uh, duty is the substance of liberty, and liberty is the form of duty. And when I began to think about that statement in light of the teachings of the Urantia book, I began to see that uh, love, because love is greater than duty, love is the substance of liberty, and liberty is the form of love. So, so long as we are held embraced by love, uh, we actually have uh, liberty, you know. So we know that when we're coming from places of anger, from places of jealousy, places of resentment, uh, that we're not uh, coming from places of the spirit. We are not walking the path of the spirit. We're not in pursuit of the divine as we could do, you know. Fear and shame are unworthy motivations for religious giving. And I like that one of the cool things in the Urantia book too, uh, that Jesus was always a positive teacher. You know, that he, he what was it he said to, how could one hunger for something not to do? You know, his idea of love was, it was like an addictive growing 
transforming energy, which the more you uh, became uh, caught up in it, the more enthralling it became, so that your life was uh, taken over by love and was filled by uh, the beauty and value and the liberty that comes from uh, following love, you know. And we know when we're not giving in to, to when we're not allowing ourselves to be to be ruled by love, we're, we're not really following after God, you know, even though some people will uh, claim righteous indignation. Oh, my anger is a holy anger. That's usually just self-deception. Um, happy and effective person is motivated not by fear of wrongdoing, but by the love of right doing. And we all love that. You know, we all enjoy uh, bringing joy to others and helping them uh, live happier lives and sorting things out for them. And Jesus was always, always had his eye out to, uh, to help other people. You know, he'd gladly stop a, a big session with a lot of people just to help one old lady move her bags. You know, he was that kind of guy and he enjoyed it. He enjoyed it. And we all do too. So here, the fruits of the spirit, these are, this is where the rubber meets the road really when it comes to how the eternal integrates with time. We are asked to bear the fruits of the spirit. And I showed you a seed earlier on that had, uh, that was pointing towards the sun. And in our lives, we're supposed to bear these fruits. And we're told that if these fruits are not in, in being born, then that person isn't for real. Now, when you look at these things, they're all very special. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. They're, they're, they're great. But it, Jesus points out again, in order to do the works, you have to have the, the energy. You have to have the spiritual energy to perform these things, to bear these fruits. It's the same thing again, okay? Now, the Orantia book makes this fascinating claim. Spiritual life, like physical energy, is consumed. Spiritual efforts result in relative spiritual exhaustion. It's important, kids. So when we think of spiritual exhaustion, then, that means we, we, we're running out of the means where, whereby we can manifest these fruits. We're running out of the means whereby we can be patient. We are not as kind anymore. We're not as generous. We're running low on joy. Our peace is evaporating. We're not as gentle. We're kind of rough with people. We're abrupt, you know, and self-control begins to vanish. We're easily angered. We uh, lean into the liquor or into the drugs or whatever it is, distraction that we, we in order to avoid uh, looking at the, the thing that's bothering us. So, Spiritual practices like meditation, like prayer, like the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness, they nourish the soul and help you keep focused. And when you look at things like peace, patience, and kindness, and you watch yourself, you remain watchful of yourself, and you realize that actually I'm I'm getting burnt out here. And I'm because I'm getting burnt out, I'm actually have less positive to contribute to the conversation or to whatever experience is going on. So I need to go and recharge my batteries. So through prayer, through reflection, through writing, through creativity, through dance, whatever it is that recharges your batteries, uh, the connection with God, the, the experience of gratitude, the, the, the search and pursuit of things uh, up to be grateful for your health, your freedom, the, the sun in the sky, the wind in your face, um, you know, the laughter of your friends, there's endless things that we can be grateful for, which can help us recharge our batteries. And in our pursuit of uh, our being godlike, we need to be conscious of uh, those habits which tend to uh, sap the spirit, which take the joy out of our life, which uh, rob us of peace, and find ways to enhance and increase these things, to bear these things abundantly. This is what Jesus said is one of the most important things we can do in our whole lives. You know, so given specific attention to these uh, fruits and their presence in our life and the giving them away to others is really important. But I, when you look at things like this, like, uh, you know, kindness, patience, forgiveness, like patience means somebody's trying you. <laughs> you know, forgiveness means somebody has done you wrong. You know, Jesus didn't allow the, the how would you say, the fallen nature of others to dictate whether or not he should love them. He didn't give tit for tat. He always responded with the more positive thing. And uh, as a result of that, was a victor in his life completely. You know, he didn't allow himself to be taken over by his anger. Uh, so again, this, this uh, particular quote is evidence of true spiritual development uh, consists in the exhibition of a human personality motivated by love, activated by unselfish ministry, and dominated by the wholehearted worship of the perfection ideals of divinity and 
I've contemplated those ideas a lot and the, their importance in our lives. And when God uh, speaks, like you know, and tells us to be perfect, even as He is perfect, and that it's not, it's it's a thrilling adventure to the actualization of a richer existence. You know, it's a magnificent thing. And but the, we reap exactly as we sow. Like you, you can't perfection isn't just handed. It's earned, it's strived, you know, it, it involves conflict, struggle, effort, uh, and always the end result will be uh, a better you, a happier you, and uh, a more positive milieu or circumstances, you know. This is uh, from James Allen, and I really like this. Uh, it's, I think, uh, highly instructive. The grace and beauty that were in Jesus can be of no value to you, cannot be understood by you, unless they are also in you and they can never be in you until you practice them for apart from doing the qualities which constitute goodness do not as far as you're concerned exist to adore jesus for his good qualities is a long step towards truth but to practice those qualities is truth itself and he who fully adores the perfection of another will not rest content in his own imperfection but will fashion his soul after the likeness of that other. Therefore, you who adore Jesus for his divine qualities, practice those qualities yourself, and you too shall be divine. Awesome. That's another one of them. Dream lofty dreams, and as you dream, so shall you become. Your vision is the promise of what you shall one day be. Your ideal is the prophecy of what you shall at last unveil. The achievement was at first and for a time a dream. The oak sleeps in the acorn. The bird waits in the egg. And in the highest vision of the soul, a waking angel stirs. Your circumstances may be uncongenial, but they shall not long remain so when you perceive an ideal and strive to reach it. And this is from the Urantia book. The pursuit of the ideal, the striving to be godlike, is a continuous effort before death and after. It is not so much what mind comprehends as what mind desires to comprehend and ensure survival. It is not so much what mind is like as what mind is striving to be like that constitutes spirit identification. What you are today is not so important as what you are becoming day by day and in eternity. These things are incredibly inspiring, and liberating, and encouraging, you know, and I, I kind of we can get overwhelmed by who we are and what we've done, where we've come from. And the spirit kind of says, don't worry about that. That doesn't matter. What matters is what you aspire to be and what you're sincerely endeavoring every day to be, you know? Are you sincerely endeavoring to be godlike? Are you endeavoring to manifest that spirit of service, that servant mindedness that is uh, a part of the divine nature? Um, I think, yeah, we might read this just for the fun. There is in the mind of God a plan which embraces every creature of all his vast domains. And this plan is an eternal purpose, boundless opportunity, unlimited progress and endless life. And the infinite treasures of such a matchless careers are yours for the striving. The goal of eternity is ahead. The adventure of divinity attainment lies before you. The race for perfection is on whoever will may enter, and certain victory will crown the efforts of every human being who will run the race of faith and trust, depending every step of the way on the leading of the indwelling adjuster and the guidance of that good spirit of the universe son who so freely has been poured out upon all flesh. So, okay. So how long did that take? 35 minutes, 37 minutes, not so bad. Okay, any thoughts, any questions, any reflections, any insights? Uh, thank you all very much for, uh, for being here. Great to see you all. Hi, Rita. Hi, Monica. I see you. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that that topic you could uh, you could discuss all day. Um, I I love it. Um, there's a there's a lot of ways you could spin it out. Like I've been 
uh, given courses and uh, things like this for for a while now. You know, I've been very very interested um, in helping people uh, realize their potential. Um, for me, the divine within you is uh, is basically the the best thing of you. You know, and uh, the more you can get it out of you, the more you can get out of your own way, the the, the happier things. Uh, Will be in your life you know and it's not without struggle it's not without struggle um the following god is uh, never ever going to be an easy uh, task you know um especially if the angels are on your case because they love to give you a hard time which i know from personal experience i'm a man of many sorrows uh but yeah no i can keep talking until somebody asks a question or somebody has a hand up a Carol Engel Enright. No. It, no, Barry. It's Rita here from Australia. Hello there. Hello. I look, I just just laughed. You were very quick in talking. I had to turn up my ears to really get it all in. <laughs> Sorry, I do that. I have a habit, especially good. when I get excited. Sorry. Yeah, no, good, good thoughts. Good excitement too. Now, look, you mentioned or you had uh, one quote up from somebody that you sort of referred to as it was the source, the so, uh, one of the source authors for the Urantia book. Yes. Look, I just, uh, something struck me yesterday and I went on to a site and I read this. I just wondered if you can remember, all of you, that sentence, the function of prayer or, or, or similar, the function of prayer is not to influence God, but rather to change the nature of the one who prays. Mm. And guess who that is from? Søren Kierkegaard. Oh. Right. So that would be somebody to look up. Oh, yes. And, yeah. I mean, I didn't go through them all, but I thought this one, I know that one. That's <laughs> <a book." laughs> Yeah, I've... Uh... I've often, to me, prayer is one of the key ways to, to affect uh, victory over the flesh. You know, we, we, we have all sorts of um, bad habits. And for me, prayer is one of the best ways of, of uh, tackling uh, bad habits. You know, prayer and, of course, meditation. You know, uh, meditation helps you uh, maintain, uh, to be mindful, you know. To, say, to kind of not watch us, watch what you're thinking up here and say, okay, God's way, not your way, <laughs> you know, yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. make a distinction between the, 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 I would say, the impulses of the flesh and the urgence of the angels, you know. That's right. Uh, and even if, even if we're doing it wrong, yeah. prayer is communication with God. And like we said earlier, sharing your inner life. Yeah. And you know, once you start doing that and expose yourself to the light, so to speak, then they can start to tweak you and pull you in and yes. it'll come right. I mean, I, I have got no worries about these things because luckily, uh, you know, you, you trust in the process and you trust in the promise that mm -hmm. you will be, you will be and you are taken care of. And so I just muggle through and get my, my shoes dirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was uh, read a thing there recently. Said uh, it doesn't matter how uh, weak and confused your prayers are, because what matters is the one to whom your the prayers are addressed. Yes, yeah, yeah. He's the guy. He's got it figured out. Yeah, I've got only one red telephone, and that's <laughs> 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 and that's yeah, to our pie. Yeah, thank you, Barry. No, thank you, thank you. We've yes, got a hand raise from Carol Engel Enright. <clears throat> Hi, this is Carol. I'm in Colorado. Hi. My Hi. question Hi. is, I, I come from an evangelical background as well, and am new um, to Urantia. Mm -hmm. And I found, uh, so I loved your talk. I loved um, you. How, you, how you were talking, especially that picture of the marble and um, and cutting through the marble. Mm. Um, I teach at a university and I find this new generation, um, um, they're, they're seeking so much and, um, and they, they have such a swayed vision of God and certainly of Jesus. And I just wonder 
if you're ever working with young adults and how we could um, how can how can we talk to them and how can we lead them to a book that is so deep um, that requires <laughs> that requires such a depth of understanding um, and and they seem to not want to dive into um, or or is it just their youth? I'm, I guess well, that's part of it is youth. Like I. I reflect on, on my own experiences, you know, like when I was a kid, I was incredibly angry, bitter, resentful, and angry at God. And for a while I became an ionist. I didn't believe in anything. Uh, so I kind of see myself as a kind of case example of how, how do you talk to me when I was so angry with God or when I didn't believe in anything and I met at least so I met out. I didn't believe in anything. And I think the role of the shepherd is uh, important here. Okay. So, if you notice a member of the, the, her, the flock is disappeared. So that, that's what children are. They're, they're part of God's children. The key is to listen. So for me, when I'm with people, my number one thing to do is to try and listen to what's going on in them, you know, to try and see what they really need. Because I know myself, um, you know, even up into my 20s, I wouldn't have been able to accept the Urenti book, but there had to be a process along the way of growth to the point where I was receptive to it. And the most important thing, I think, that you can help somebody uh, find is a positive connection with the divine. If they can get a hold of that rope, they can pull themselves out of the hole. So an important part of that is listening to, to see where they're at, see where they're um, emotionally, intellectually, what do they have in terms of inspiration values? You know, right now there's a guy called Jordan B. Peterson and he's very, very popular with uh, a lot of young people, a lot of young men. And he's, uh, how do you say, he's, uh, he's got a series of lectures on the psychological significance of scripture. And I think that's a good way to help people who are a bit apprehensive or agnostic or don't know how to, to approach it, to look at scripture uh, for its inspirational value, you know, and to see that because these things help us uh, frame the universe in a more positive light, you know, even something as uh, silly as astro astrology, you know, that the, there's a implied in astrology is that the, the universe is a consciously managed thing, you know, and it responds to intelligent action, you know, uh, good actions lead to good results, bad actions lead to bad results that we reap as we sow. And when young people are uh, confused about things, there's an opportunity for, for them to kind of reflect upon, do they believe in karma, you know? And if they believe in karma, then what is the possible result of accumulated positive karma in, in the pursuit of things like perfection? You know, like when we look at something like perfection, perfection is a, an opportunity for us to journey towards a, a greater self, you know, and we all have the power to do that and nobody has the power to take that from us, you know, and when I meet young people and I discuss these things with them, you know, you can always see, they're always looking for uh, something inspiration, something encouraging. You know, there's a, there's a saying in the scripture, make straight away for the Lord, you know. And I often, when I find people, I find that they're, they've got certain blockages, philosophical problems that they have with the idea of God, you know. And they need to, you need to kind of sidestep that challenge and say, no, look at it from this side or look at it from that side. And help them make the connection with God. And if they can make that connection with God, they're on a, they're in a good track, you know? It, like the, the apostles were led by the spirit to Jesus, you know? The, their adjusters shepherded them into the, into the presence of Jesus. And uh, that's, they say that inside in the, the scripture too, it's there in the, the New Testament, like, you know, they were led in the spirit of the Lord. And we have to trust in the spirit that's in them, you know? that there is a, a victor inside them and to communicate that positivity to them that you see and know and true faith can definitely see a victor in them and it's up to them to get out of their own way and let that uh, let that god within loose in life you know um like i have to laugh at that that atheism gets any traction in in the world anymore you know because it's like there's the gospel which means the good news atheism is like the bad spell you know, it's like 
Uh, you're a big cosmic accident. You're a fluke and you're about to vanish and there's nothing. You know, and we're just making it all up and we're going along with it for the crack. And some atheists say, that's what makes life precious. No, it's not. That makes life meaningless. That is ridiculous. And to try and promote that and to think anybody would, would get any sucker of that is beyond me. You know, once upon a time I did it, but that's part of the angry and I was resentful. But uh, I think that people are more, how would you say, they hunger for, for hope, they hunger for inspiration. And you can give people that insofar as you have it yourself. You can't give them what you don't have, you know. So by maintaining a positive connection, that positivity in your life will radiate out and people will recognize that energy and young people will too. You know, you will have a confidence and a faith and a courage that they lack. And Jesus talked about that and how that is incredibly attractive. It's a spiritual allure. And you can you can you can present that to people. Um, but the key part of it, I think, is authenticity. When you are talking with people that you are genuinely interested in them and you're not just one of the people that want to give them something. I'm here to sell you Jesus, you know, because they're just going to throw in your face. If you're interested in forming an authentic connection with people, that will allow you to uh, help them find their way out, you know? to find uh, liberty and truth, uh, and to find hope in in, uh, in God. You know, it, it can be done. I've seen it happen. You know, when you when you listen to people, because I meet people in passing, and uh, say here in Ireland now, before this lockdown, you'd be inside the pub, and somebody would be talking to you about their troubles and their woes, and there's always a way that you can. Uh, share a little something that's inspiring, a way to reframe the, the, the situation, a way to put them in touch with inspiring uh, spiritual realities or structures, you know, that, that things are usually work for the better, you know, even though sometimes they can look like a calamity. Um, and people will take that and they'll run with it, you know, and eventually once God gets in there, he can do some great work, great transforming work uh, for them. Uh, in their life, you know, because you can't do all the work, you can't save them, you know, they save themselves, they save God, but you can plant seeds, you know, you can, you can challenge uh, ideas that they hold, you know, uh, you can ask questions about the things that they believe, and say, really, that, you really believe that, you know, you can, you can offer a critique without uh, crushing their spirit, and uh, people will, will, will respond to that, especially if it's, if it's uh, done with tact and grace, you know, um, you can, there's, there's always ways you can, you can lead people on because they, they, people are attracted to the positive. They're attracted to the hopeful, you know. I see somebody called Dan that has a hand up. Yeah, this is Dana from uh, Southern Indiana. Hi, Dana from Southern Indiana. Northeastern middle of the U.S. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned, it's a great presentation. Thanks for saying. Thank you. Thank very you very much. much. Um, early, you mentioned... Um, that this concept theosis is um, is um, more developed or more paid attention to in the Eastern Orthodox. Did did mm -hmm. I hear you correctly? That's yeah. right. Yes. Now, I'm I'm just curious um, if if you think then this concept uh, and and this whole discussion that we've had is a uh, is a way uh, that we should think of of uh, interacting with folks in that tradition. Mm. Uh, is it is it more of an opening uh, to present uh, teachings in the Urantia book to folks in that tradition? Possibly, possibly. I've seen a paper presented uh, by Byron Belitsos on the Eastern tradition in the Urantia book, mm -hmm. um, and but I, I haven't seen anybody really kind of try to bring the Urantia book in via that route, you know, to, into the traditions. But it seems to me that. I, I don't know that they would be as, um, how would you say, hostile and afraid of it as the traditions of the West. Traditions of the West have got an awful lot of damnation going on, you know. And uh, there, there's, there's traditions in the West tend to have uh, like a fear cult mind, you know, that if the minute you step out of the tradition, you fall into hell. <laughs> you know, and that was one of the problems I had with, uh, with traditional Christianity. And um, so, whereas the, the traditions of the East are much more mystical, and as a consequence, I'd imagine they might be a lot more receptive to some of the stuff because they don't they don't have the hang up that they have in the in the in the West, you know. So the, I, I would see a, a good opportunity there, you know, for an evangelist who's, who's in that area, you know. But again, a key part is getting to know the teachings and learning how to speak 
to people's language, you know. And like when we look at Jesus' life, he began early in his life, even from his teens, to not draw attention to himself, to look like everybody else, even though he was God made flesh, you know, he managed to hide in plain sight, you know. And uh, he didn't, he, he did this key thing, you know, uh, uh, to adjust your message, to let your light so shine that people are illuminated thereby and not blinded. It's something like your anti book, which so many of us know, it's a blinding revelation. If you start hitting people with that, they'd be like, whoa, get that. No, 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 no. But there are countless magical things inside it. Like I use that statement there about spiritual uh, energy becomes exhausted. I've used that in, in uh, lectures where I talk about, look at the fruits of the spirit, you know, peace, love, joy, patience, forgiveness, you know. Everybody knows those things. And when you, those things are running low, you're running out, your spiritual batteries are running low. So I'm able to use the teachings in a, in a way that doesn't set off alarm bells. And at the same time, uh, revitalizes the spiritual life of the people that I'm talking with, you know. People come away, like I got a shot in the air, and oof, I feel good after that, you know. I feel like I've established a better connection with the divine now, I, that, that there's actually positive energy and intelligence around me and working for me and with me. So, uh, yeah, I can see opportunity, great opportunity in the Eastern traditions. Uh, but again, it's the, it's, you need, to go, you need a teacher, you need somebody who knows how to set it, you know. And uh, like you can't, like, in Jesus' life, he was always original, but never eccentric, you know. And I think uh, in the Oriental community, we are not short on eccentrics. And uh, that sometimes can make people kind of go, oh, I don't know if I want that, <laughs> you know. So um, a key part for us is to, to, like Jesus did, conduct himself as an honorable citizen in the state of Israel and to conduct ourselves as honorable citizens in the countries in which we live and upright neighbors and uh, how would you say, kind of help to countrymen. And through that, then, as people become familiar with us, we'll be able to let our light so shine that we can pass on the teachings and let those seeds do their transforming work. You know, that was the thing that Jesus did over and over again. He focused on something that was really cool in there. Hey, Paul, <laughs> just uh, something that was really cool and let that do its transforming work, you know. And... Um, yeah, yeah. So I definitely see an opportunity there. Because one of the things that I find interesting in the Arantia book is it never says the word theosis once. The whole book is about theosis. And it never used the word once. I couldn't understand it, you know. But uh, yeah, yeah. But I think it does have indemnization and things like that. But it doesn't use the word theosis. Mary, I'm going to I'm gonna interrupt here. This is a yep. five-minute warning. Um, in five minutes, we'll start our break. We hmm. do have two questions. I know David Henry has his hand raised, and okay. a little while ago there was a question that popped up in the chat box that you might want to address. The question is, why do the angels give uh, give people a hard time? And so <laughs> perhaps you could perhaps you could kind of elaborate on a Urantia perspective of our struggles and how that relates to becoming godlike. Okay, so um, the pursuit of perfection requires effort. Okay. The religion of the spirit, of course, effort, struggle, um, uh, challenges. So when the angels look at us, <clears throat> it, they're immediately confronted with the fact of our animal inheritance and that the, that the creature does not naturally relish hard work. <laughs> you know, so it's got to get a fire under us. And part of the problem is that we tend to, uh, to rely on props all the time. Um, we, we have a habit of, of, of leaning on crutches and these crutches could be uh, family, there could be uh, ideology, there could be religion, could be all sorts of things. And what the angels really want you to do is lean on God. And in a, a result of that, they will, uh, I've, in my experience, they will take everything away from you in order for you to find the thing of true value, you know, to seek first the kingdom. And once you found that, then you can get it all back. You know, then you can build up. But in the absence of that, which is of true value, um, it's all, rubbish, it's all uh, illusory, it's all uh, a trap, you know, that can lead you astray and lead you into a false sense of security. And uh, that's, uh, it, it's spiritually dangerous. So for your own good, they're constantly busting your bubbles, they're constantly um, uh, destroying your illusions. And very often we're very attached to our illusions and very attached to our misinterpretations. And we heartily resent 
any time that these things are taken away from us because we're like children, you know. But as we grow and mature in life, as the angels kind of help us get an appetite for destruction, <laughs> we, 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 see, we search for the wisdom in the, in the thing. And we don't take it personally and uh, resent anymore. We begin to say, okay, right, this is a universe of law and order, a universe of intelligence. Things happen for a reason, and I don't need to be bitter about it. I can start looking for the reason and uh, look at what changes I need to make in myself in order to affect um, the actualization of my higher self or higher actualization of myself. So in order to become a better version of me, I have to do things differently. So my life has to be challenged. Being progressive requires constantly changing things up, constantly renewing, constantly uh, evolving. And that requires effort, it requires energy, which is why the angels are so eager to set a fire under us, you know, to help us get the motivational energy we need to, to make the changes that we have to do. You know, after a while, then once we start to get into the swing, it's like with exercise, you know, you look forward to it, you know, and you, you actually embrace the things. They won't have to harass you anymore to pray, you know, you'll do it naturally. They won't have to, to let you fall into loads of mistakes to remind yourself to, to meditate so that you can control your mind more effectively. You know, does that help? Is that good enough? I hope so. Should we move on to um, David Henry? And then, and then in about mm -hmm. two minutes, we'll move on to a break. Or if we end up talking into the break, that's fine. But folks, mm -hmm. you should feel free that if you need to get up and get something to drink or do whatever you need to do during that time, you can do so. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, I, I think it was Astrid, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing their name correctly, uh, who asked that question. I was actually raised my hand to answer the same question that Barry just answered. <laughs> um, the only thing I think can, I can add to that, oh, by the way, Barry, I, I, I saw this uh, topic and I thought, how are you going to address that? <laughs> you, you did excellent. You did excellent. Wonderful. High five. <laughs> um, you know, um, when I'm talking to people and getting to know them and whatnot, and, and they actually believe in angels, um, I share with them that one of the jobs of the angels is to actually put us in situations that help us grow. Mm. Um, people have a concept uh, that the angels will never uh, require you to do something you're not capable of doing. But that is actually just exactly what they do. So uh, uh, mm. I'll cut this short. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example about learning. Um, um, I can remember being in a department store years ago, and there were a whole bunch of people around. I was checking out, and there was a woman next to me, and talk about learning lessons. I mean, us men, you know, we can be really thick-headed. You know, we really can. We, we have to learn things over oh, and over again. There are certain things that we can learn right away. I looked over at this woman, and I congratulated her for being pregnant. And she goes, I'm not pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, men, fess up. How many times have you ever done that? Well, I can see the faces on some men. Is there anyone, anyone, are you kidding? You really did that? I'll guarantee there's a mistake I made, and the angels didn't do this. I did this. Okay? <laughs> I'm never, ever going to make that mistake ever, ever again. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> thank thank yes, you. Yes. Thank you, Barry. Great, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys, thank you very much for, uh, for joining me, and uh, thanks to everybody for listening, and uh, thanks to all the people who are going to see this in the future, and uh, have a great time. Thanks, Barry. You guys can head off for your break, and we'll meet you back here in a few minutes. Thank you, Barry. Appreciate hey, it. Paul. <laughs>